turn with me. We want to reverence God's word and ask that you stand one more time. We get our exercise here sunlight. If you can physically do it, we understand if you cannot. But young people especially, make sure we stand for God's word. And we're going to turn to the gospel of Matthew. All of our graduates and even those young people, but even our adults today, we pray this message is relevant to all of us. Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14. We're going to commence at verse 22. Again, good to see Pastor Talbert in the house with us today. And if we have any other ministers or clergy, we're certainly always honored to have you in our presence. And uh, those who are visiting with us, we are so grateful to have each and every one of you. Uh, we normally have uh, a visitors and a, and a greeting fellowship. But on these special days, we don't want to neglect or ignore the fact that you may be here. So all of our persons who are visiting, we thank God for you. We know you could have chosen to be anywhere. We thank you for being with us today on this special worship occasion. Matthew 14, starting in verse 22. 22. It reads this way in the New International Version. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. There Peter goes again. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. And finally, when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And today I want to, with the Lord's help and your prayers, preach from the subject, it's a journey, not a destination. Yeah. Amen. You may be seated. It's a journey. It's a journey, not a destination. Thank you, Deacon Mitchell. Appreciate you. Graduates, young people, look to your left and right, look at someone and say, it's a journey, not a destination. Amen. Amen. You've heard it said that success is a journey, not a destination. This mantra has been and continues to be modeled in the lives of many, including each of you who are here, who are daring to live triumphantly in a world, young people, full of challenge and difficulty. One such person, worthy of our attention today, began his journey toward greatness in the shadows of obscurity, but would leave an indelible mark upon the lives he touched and the society in which he lived. Things quietly changed for him, sisters and brothers, at the same time that things were also shifting on some fronts in these, the United States of America and even abroad. It was the year 1950, and while this was certainly not a fond time to remember for most of us who are black in America, it was the exact time that a young black boy's journey toward greatness would begin. In 1950, some in America were enjoying the character Charlie Brown and the first Peanuts comic strip. Others were privileged to enjoy the first multi-purpose credit card released by the Diners Club. 
Many of our ancestors were still living in fear of those who occupied and abused their positions of power in the government and law enforcement. Our foreparents were relegated to second class citizenship, living without the right to vote and being denied still entry into uh, attending certain institutions of higher learning, not because they did not have the adequate intelligence or acumen, but because they simply did not have the right skin tone. Yet in the midst of all of this contrast, <clears throat> what came out of it uh, was that while some were privileged and some were living in pain, there was a young black boy from Richmond, Virginia, who picked up a tennis racket and his life was never the same. Well, he would go on to become the first and only African-American male tennis player to win the prestigious competitions known as the U.S. Open and the Wimbledon, as well as ascend to become the number one tennis player in the world. His name was Arthur Ashe. God has been good to us because many other men and women of color have emerged to play tennis successfully, most notably Venus and Serena Williams, who had completely shattered all limitations in the sport of tennis for African Americans. And we've had others like Tiger Woods, and we've had many others, uh, men and women, who have trailblazed, who have blazed a trail and a path, and who have given young people like you all and, and graduates like you all an opportunity to be exactly where you are. But here's what I want you to understand. Each of these success stories have this in common. True greatness, success, significance, and impact will only Elijah manifest when one understands that a destination cannot be appreciated without the journey. Right. Right. I said something then. I want you all to hold on to it today, young people. Graduates, I want you to hold on to it because just because you have arrived at this particular destination, <clears throat> your true manifestation of God's grace and glory and gifts in your life is not that you merely arrived at your intended destination, but that he kept you on the journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Someone here ought to say amen. <laughs> That it's not merely about destinations in life, but about journeys. Because destinations speak to where God has brought us. Journeys speak to how God brought us. Yeah, yeah. Destinations speak to arriving at an intended place. Journeys speak to being sustained over a period of time. Yeah. Destinations speak to God bringing us to where he wants us to be. Journey speaks to how God kept you in your right mind and kept provision and kept supplying all of your needs. Not some, not most, not many, but every single one of your needs. And do I have anybody here who can testify and who can attest to the fact that you not only made it to your intended destination, but you learned to shout because when you look back on it, you had a journey before you ever arrived at your destination. Do I have anybody here that can, can attest to the fact that sometimes journeys get tough and journeys get long and journeys get hard and journeys get difficult, but we're here to shout and celebrate and testify and you better help me because I'm almost done that you can't appreciate arriving at your destination if you forget to appreciate how God kept you every step of the way on your journey. Yeah. Right there. You see, graduates, the journey makes us and shapes us. Yes, sir. It forms us and conforms us and molds us and matures us into who we are. Watch this. So that when we arrive at our destination, we won't forget that it was God who helped us to get there. And in addition to the Lord, it was some other people who helped you get where you are. Someone here, maybe no one here, but someone here, you know someone else who's arrived at a destination. They've arrived at promotion. They've arrived at prosperity. They've arrived and ascended into prominence and prestige 
and financial stability and surplus, but they have neglected to remember, they have forgotten that they weren't always there, and now they walk around as if they made it by themselves. But do I have anybody here that can assess the fact that you know you're not where you are because of merely who you are? You're not where you are merely because of your intelligence, because God gave you the intelligence. It's not your resume, but it's the resume God gave you. It's not your money, but it's the money God put in your pocket. It's not your good looks, but it's the good looks that God gave you. Thank God because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That means you are uniquely shaped. That means if you got big lips and wide hips, maybe you ought to walk with confidence. That means if you got long hair or short hair, you got wavy hair or nappy hair. Comb that nappy hair, put on your makeup, tuck in your shirt, brothers, pull up your pants, put socks on, put shoes on, put a suit coat on, put a smile on your face, keep God in your heart, and get to stepping because it's not about merely arriving. The journey. The journey. The journey. Anyone who has arrived anywhere and achieved anything of significance, and can I slide this in, graduates, young people, listen to me, focus, listen up here. You can be famous and not have a life of any significance. All right. Wow. I wish somebody would help me right there. There are a whole lot of folk that are famous, but their lives have no significance attached to money and parties, money and cars, money and cash and credit and, 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 and Instagram and, and likes and posts, but no significance. And you've got to ask yourself, graduates, you got to ask yourself, young people, and grown people, you got to ask yourself, what do I want more? Do I want fame? Or do I want significance? Because can I tell you something? You can live a life of significance. And God will open doors for you that your intelligence and your credentials may not open. That your ambition and your aspiration may not open. But if you keep your life in God's hands and you strive to live a significant life, a life in service to others, let God take care of what status you have in life. Because this is important. I'm going to get back to my script. If you get on Instagram and if you get on Facebook, which just banned a man who may not be a Christian, but who speaks truth to systems in power, Farrakhan. They just banned him from Instagram and Facebook. Why, young people? Because he's not afraid as a black man in America to tell the rest of America the truth about herself. All right. See how quiet some of us act even right. in the black church? Because America is comfortable with a black man that's many miles and quiet. Yeah. All right. yeah. I know I won't get any man's right here, but that's all right. Oh, yeah. But America's afraid of a black man or a sister that will dare to open her mouth and stand with her shoulders and articulate truth. Yeah, yeah. Not obnoxiously or belligerently. Yes, sir. So, young men, you have the gift of presence. Young sisters, you have the gift that God has given you. Don't squander it and waste it by pressing sin on the wrong message on Instagram and Facebook and cost yourself future opportunities because the firm that checks your background goes to see what you did 10 years ago on your social media platform. So it's a journey. It's a journey and somebody here can say that you had someone praying for you 
Someone here ought to be glad, as we said earlier, that somebody's been praying for you. That you had big mama praying, you had papa praying, you had parents praying, you had cousins and them praying. And just in case you've had to travel this journey without your mother, without your father, without those that you love, I'm glad that we have a God whose son, as I said earlier, prays on our behalf. Because it is a journey. And you know what I love about it? I'm going to get right to the text. When God is operating on your behalf, nothing in this life can derail your progress or prevent you from achieving and accomplishing what he has ordained for you. Watch this. Unless you step out of his will for your life. Thank Holy Ghost. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. As long as you're in God's will, graduates, you'll achieve everything God has prepared for you. But the moment you do what Jonah did and you go in the opposite direction of where God said go, you will run into problems. Yeah. 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 It's a journey. And you gotta let God operate on your behalf. These plans, however, demand that we appreciate the path, the journey that God requires us to take because the journey gives us our testimony. The journey is what allows us to shout when we get to the graduation stage. The journey is what makes tears come down your face when you attend the graduation and see your family member, you see your child, your grandchild, your niece, your nephew, your sister, your brother, your mother, your father, your grandparents, when you see them walking, when you see them graduating, when you see them accomplished, it's the journey that they took yes, sir. that shapes their testimony. And so there's just a couple of things that I want us to understand about journeys and I want us to understand it when we look at this text. In our story today, we have the disciples who are out at sea and young people, a storm has come. Yeah. The boat starts rocking and reeling and the disciples are scared, they're shook. They're nervous, they're fearful, and they're uncertain if they're going to make it to the other side. And what I've come to tell you all today, to preach and give to you all today is the lessons that the disciples had to learn and the lessons that I want you to hold on to as you continue on this journey called life. You see... In the text, we find out that when you are making not literal journeys, but a faith journey, I want you to understand that you must know the danger and learn the danger of misplaced satisfaction. Yeah, yeah. Stay with me because I'm almost done. Graduates, young people, remember this as you journey through life. Understand the danger of misplaced satisfaction. How do I know? Because when I look at the text, if you go to verse uh, 22, it says immediately yeah. Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Yep. Yeah. Why is that, brothers and sisters? Well, if you go back and read your Bible, the verses ahead, Pastor Tower, they describe for us the scene in which Jesus had fulfilled the feeding miracle. Yes, sir. There were 5,000, brothers and sisters, that uh, 5,000 men, not including women and children, that were fed merely by Jesus taking fish and loaves and breaking them. And every time he broke it, Elijah, it kept multiplying. Every time he broke it, it kept dividing. Every time he broke it, sisters, brothers, it kept multiplying, kept dividing, kept expanding, kept becoming more and more. And by the end of it, they had fed all the men, all the women, all the children, and still had leftovers. But here's what happened. 
Jesus understood the inclination of the crowd and the influence, watch this, that the wrong crowd could have on his disciples. Now I said something young people, I'm going to repeat it. Jesus understood the inclination of the crowd and he understood the influence the crowd could have on his disciples. What was their inclination? To make Jesus king right away. To merely become enthralled by his divine power, but miss his primary mission, which was not merely to feed them with bread and fish, but to save their soul. And so Jesus, the Bible says, had compassion and he fed them. But when he recognized that these folk, if he let his disciples stay too long, were going to be in, they were going to influence the disciples, he said, y'all get on the boat and I'm going to catch up to y'all. Go ahead of me. I'll come back to that later. Go ahead of me. I'm coming, but go ahead of me. And he dismissed the crowd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The crowd was grateful for the food, but they were not interested in what Jesus had to offer regarding eternal life. Right. Watch this now. Because the Bible says they ate and were satisfied. Nothing wrong with Jesus feeding the 5,000. But the issue is they were satisfied with bread and fish. And not with the source of the bread and the fish. Because I already said there was not enough food at first to feed all of them. So Jesus was holding the resource, the food. But Jesus was representative of the divine source. And the Bible says the crowd ate the food and was satisfied. They were content just to get the fish sandwich with some hot sauce on <laughs> They were content just to get their hot plate and go on about their business. And you will miss out on opportunities in this life, graduates, if you have misplaced satisfaction. If you become content with merely what resources you can accumulate in this life, but don't strive to remain connected to the source of all that you enjoy in life. You have misplaced satisfaction. satisfaction. Yeah. And can I tell you something? You've got to be intentional, watch this, about developing and cultivating the right appetite. Because if you develop an appetite for that which is unhealthy and detrimental, it'll be as if you go to eat fast food every day. Eventually, junk food will catch up to your digestive system and your circulatory system and your liver and your pancreas and, 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 and your stomach and all the other organs. It'll affect your heart. You'll have high blood pressure and cholesterol. All right. <laughs> If you're at Ball's Chicken every other day <laughs> and Popeye's in between, I've been guilty also. But you got to mix in some fresh vegetables and some salad and you got to mix in some, some fluids, some healthy fluids like water and like water. My wife says, Did you drink some water today? Because you don't want to have misplaced satisfaction. Jesus had compassion on the crowd. Okay, did you notice? When you are following God, when you are a follower of Jesus, when you are called to follow Jesus, you have to sometimes be separated from the crowd. You have to be willing to stand out, to be separated, to be set apart. While God dismissed the crowd, Jesus dismissed them and said, disciples, go ahead. Travel ahead. You see, our greatest satisfaction, watch this, cannot be centered on what God merely does for us. 
But it's got to be rooted in what God does with us and through us. The crowd represented Jesus blessing them. It represented what God did for them. The disciples represent what God did with them and through them. Yeah. What he was trying to develop within them and do through them. And you have to ask yourself, what do I want to be? Do I want to be the person that merely receives what God has for me? Or do I want to be a person that God uses? And, and that be a person that God sends blessings through. Yes, sir. Some of us are so preoccupied with receiving, we can't send anything. <laughs> we can't be conduits of anything because we're so preoccupied with receiving. And have you ever noticed that when you forget about Brother Sister Edwards about what you're going to get and you start looking at what you can give, that God has a way of giving back to you more than everything you can have you ever noticed, Sister, Sister Cookie, good to see you, that when God decides to give you and bless you and you bless somebody else, that he'll always have enough for you? Yeah. That even if it's not money, it's peace of mind. Because sometimes you need what you can't buy at Walmart, what you can't purchase at Costco, what you can't go buy at Target. Sometimes you just need encouragement. Sometimes you need peace. Sometimes you need mercy. Sometimes you need grace. Sometimes you need a door to be open. Sometimes you need somebody to be a little bit more lenient with you. Sometimes you need somebody to put their arms around you. And you can't buy all of that. All right. No, no, no. So be aware. I'm almost done, young people. I'm almost done, graduates. Learn the danger of misplaced satisfaction. Don't go through the journey of life and be content with the accumulation of resources. Don't be content with what God can do for you. Strive to be a person that God can use so he can do something with you and through you. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing that I've done. Not only should we be aware of the danger of misplaced satisfaction, but I also want you all graduates and young people and all of the people of God who are here today to understand this secondly and finally. We must learn to possess the courage to maintain our convictions. We must possess courage to maintain our convictions. Well, Why am I saying that? It's because in this life, faith will be tested. Your belief system will be tested. Every one of us can have faith, belief, trust, and confidence in God when we have no problems. When there's no storm on the sea. When there are no winds blowing in our lives. But the disciples were being tested now, but not to because, Sister Williams, now they were on a boat. Watch this. Watch this, Brother Aaron. They were on a boat without Jesus in a storm. Now, listen to this. Thank Holy Ghost. There's one, there's an, an, an additional episode in the Gospels where Jesus was on the boat. Yeah. I'm getting happy just thinking about that right now. But this time, Jesus isn't on the boat. No. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you don't see God? You can't figure out where God is. He seems distant. He seems aloof. He seems like he's neglectful as your heavenly father. The text says they were a considerable distance away yeah. from Jesus. But I love this. Watch this. Jesus was about to teach them a lesson that I'm going to share with you and then I'm going to shout and sit down. Yes, sir. Sisters and brothers, Jesus, watch this, was about to teach them the necessity of maintaining their convictions of faith. You know why? Because Jesus started walking on the water. And the Bible says they were so afraid that they thought Jesus was a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> they had not yet, based on the fact that they were fearful of Jesus, 
they had not fully embraced who Jesus was. Listen to this now. This is an indictment on the disciples. Because think of the ghost Mark 6. In the Gospel of Mark chapter 6, you'll find actually explicitly says that the disciples had hardened hearts. They were callous. And the only reason you can doubt and stay doubtful about God is one thing to have momentary weakness and lapse of faith. It's another thing to remain doubtful of God. You know where, where doubt comes from? Doubt is rooted in a hesitant heart. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. A hardened heart, watch this, starts out as a hesitant heart. And a hesitant heart is a hindered heart. Because in the Greek, it really means that your heart is dull. That nothing can stimulate anything within you. Wow. That you are literally grown dull. That you look at what God is doing and it does nothing for you. You have, a, you have sustained hesitation regarding who God is and what he can do for you. And if you're not careful, watch this. You move from being hesitant with God to being hardened and hostile toward God. That's why Jesus, think Holy Ghost, called the Pharisees and scribes hypocrites. Because they were hardened in their heart. They were not merely dull, but devious. See, a dull heart still has a chance to be restored. A devious heart is in bad shape. And you're in danger of moving to the point of no return. Because when you hesitate too long and you clearly see what God is doing, but you refuse to embrace it, you end up hardened in your heart. Hey, girl, do you remember when uh, Gideon, <clears throat> I'm almost done, Gideon was called by God? And the Bible says, young people, that God was going to take Gideon. He was from the least of all the families, Brother Eric. And he, God was going to take him and use him in a, in a great and grand way. But Gideon didn't understand why God was going to use somebody as lowly and insignificant as he was to do something so great, Brother Jefferson. And so he said, God, please don't get angry with me. President Hawkins, he said, please don't, don't get angry. He just said, but, but God, if you would simply do this for me, just give me confirmation that it's you telling me to do this. He said, wet the ground with dew. But keep the fleece dry. <laughs> and he watched God do that. And he said, God, please don't get angry. You ever been there? Where you wanted clarity of God's voice? You weren't trying to be obstinate with God. But you wanted to be sure that it was the Lord speaking to you. I guess I'm the only one who's ever prayed to God. Would you make it clear to me? Would you make it really clear so I understand? And Gideon said, now God, flip it around for me. Please don't get mad. But God just... Make the fleece wet and keep the, keep the ground dry. <laughs> because Gideon understood if I can walk outside and look at wet ground and a dry fleece and then walk back outside and see a wet fleece with dry ground, only God can do that. Yeah. And Gideon saw with his own eyes. God obliged him, watch this, because he was sincere. Yes. Graduates, if you're in need of direction, be sincere. Yes. The Pharisees were sinister. Yes. They weren't trying to get clarification. They were nitpickers. Yes. They were fault finders. Yes. They merely took it upon themselves to find any violation of the law to try to trap Jesus and his disciples. But Jesus was teaching them, you cannot be out at sea. Because this isn't about, your crisis is not the storm. Your crisis is your wavering, fluctuating faith. I'm done. Yes, sir. Their crisis was not the storm. Jesus walks out to prove this to them, and I'm done. Peter gets beside himself, as usual. We often compliment Peter on walking on the water, but can I, can I challenge that today? 
It is true that Peter was obedient after Jesus said, come, and he walked on the water. God enabled him supernaturally to walk on the water. But can I share this other side of that coin with you? Jesus was not walking on the water, I submit, merely so that the disciples could get out and walk on the water. Peter just got excited and wanted to do what he saw Jesus do. Jesus obliged him, but when he took his eyes off, he started to drown. But the real reason Jesus did that was to show Peter, your crisis is not this water. Your crisis is not this wind. Because if I can walk all the way from the mountainside where I was and not be affected and I can let you walk out on it, your real crisis, brother, is not this water. It's not this storm. Come here real quick. Your crisis is your doubt. It's your willingness to believe me when I said that I am that I am. Your crisis is your wavering, fluctuating confidence. And can I tell you as I go to my clothes, young people, graduates in this life, you've got to develop a resolve to maintain and hold on to your convictions. So that when circumstances come, here it is, you don't have to worry about whether or not God can keep you in the circumstance. You need to be worried about whether or not you keep your faith in God. Yeah. Because yeah. watch this. God can handle the circumstance if you can handle holding on to your faith. Yeah, yeah. I said something there. It sounded very elementary, but it was profound. And somebody ought to testify because you live long enough to know that when you keep your faith in the Lord, God has a way of coming through when you need it. I said God has a way of coming through when you need it. Not when you want it. When you need it. He may allow you to wait, but he'll come through for you. He may allow you to suffer for a while, but he'll come through for you. He may allow you to be unemployed, underemployed, underpaid, underappreciated for a while, but he'll come through for you. He'll allow you to get sick for a while, but he'll come through for you. He'll allow you to lose somebody that you love, but he'll come through for you. He'll allow you to suffer betrayal, but he'll come through for you. He'll allow you to suffer hardship in life, but he'll come through for you. But here's what I love. When God comes through for you, you've got to learn how to do what the disciples did. Because the Bible says that before they crossed over, not after, but before they crossed over. 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 Not after, before they crossed over. They worshiped him and acknowledged that truly you are the Son of God. And do I have anybody here that wants to sit and acknowledge before? Young people, 
grown people. I've been in some storms that made me wonder if God was going to come through for me. Yes, sir. I've seen the winds blow in my life in such a way that I started to doubt whether or not God can come through. All right. I've seen the waters rise and the waves beat up against the ship in such a way that I wondered if God could still come through. But I've learned I can give God praise and rejoice in the middle of the storm. Yes, yes. Because if Jesus says, go ahead of him, Woo! that means he's coming. And our job is not to question how we're going to get there, but to believe we're going to get there. Yes. To have confidence. So the destination was getting across to Gennesaret. The journey was believing in Jesus yeah. Yeah. out at sea. Yeah. And graduates, you're about to enter the older, our, our grown graduates, our young people who are still in school, but these graduates who are adults now, and this new dean we have, you all have journeys of faith. You're still on a journey. And there will be storms. Yes. There will be storms. When you start paying for everything, there's storms. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, see, see, when you see when it's all on you, then now you gotta trust God and who God uses to bless you as you stand in the midst of a storm. When mom and daddy aren't there anymore. And so let us stand. Let us stand.